I've got a fun one for you today. The EVGA SR3 Dart. Yeah, yeah, we looked at it with the, the W3175X Xeon, but I'm going to show you why the SR3 Dart is actually a great Xeon workstation motherboard. Let's take a look. Xeon W. Isn't this motherboard just for the 3175X? You know, that overclockable processor that we first saw at Computex in 2018? Uh, no. It's socket 3647, which is Intel's server socket. So there's actually a lot of CPUs available that will work with this motherboard. Be sure to check the motherboard manual so that you know what CPUs are supported. Why would you want this motherboard for a Xeon workstation? I mean, you know, can't you buy a Xeon workstation from Dell or HP or something? Well, one, this motherboard is overbuilt to the nth degree. It's designed for the overclockers who were going to dump, you know, 1500 watts into that W3175X. And let me tell you, I've been doing that. I've even delitted the W3175X and used liquid metal on it to get it that much cooler. It's a dual 360 millimeter radiator set up behind me. Oh, and by the way, that's on. The street noise is louder than that machine. Isn't that insane? Granted, it's not overclocked right now. The trick with the EVGA SR3 Dark motherboard is that it actually does have microcode support for not just Skylake, uh, the Skylake you know, 3647 variant, but also Cascade Lake and new CPUs that have come out from Intel. Now the 3175X is overclockable, but almost all of the other Xeons are not really overclockable. And why would you want you know, an SR3 Dark for your workstation. Well, the VRM is overbuilt. Uh, power delivery is one of the most common failures, I would say, on workstation class motherboards. That Dell or OEM, you know, Dell or HP OEM system that you get, um, it's built to handle the, I guess, spec requirements of the CPU from Intel. It's not really a bad thing. It's just that when you're turboing or anything like that, it'll use more watts. That also means that the motherboard VRM circuitry heats up and you're in a situation where if things run super hot for a really long time, that dramatically shortens the silicon lifetime. Well, in a workstation, it'll burst for a little while and then it'll, it'll calm down. Technically, according to Intel, according to my good friend, Tech Tech Potato, Dr. Ian Cutris, uh, Intel says it's within spec if you're just fiddling with the PL2 1 and 2 run times and you stay within the thermal envelope. So on a motherboard like this that has an overbuilt VRM, you can still technically run those Xeons in spec, um, not technically an overclock, but you get a longer boost. The realization is that you're going to have higher performance from the SR3 dark motherboard over a sustained long period of time, think like scientific workloads, than you would from uh, you know a stock workstation. The cooling is also potentially really amazing. I've got it in a custom loop here with dual 360 millimeter radiators. That might be a little you know over your head. You don't want to fool with a custom loop. This is the Noctua. This is the U12S DX3647. This cooler is an amazing cooler for socket 3647. It's got five heat pipes. You'll probably see this in other, you know, ordinary Xeon workstations. But again, if you're running a CPU like the 3275, which is not really an overclock, you can just get those longer turbo durations. This heat sink with adequate airflow is more than enough to keep up with that CPU. I've got this configured in the Lee and Lee Dynamic XL, which does require a special bracket. Like you get the, the case in and then you have to order a little bracket, but that's not really a big deal. You can mount the giant motherboard like the SR3 Dark. I've got the rear fan configured as an intake. So I've got fresh air to help come in and uh, sort of go over top of the other, uh, you know, 360 millimeter radiator. It doesn't get above 39 degrees C with a CPU like a 3275 dual 360 millimeter radiators is extreme maximum overkill. But I do get those long turbo durations, which is nice. There are two other really interesting things about the whole Xeon workstation thing. One, registered error correcting memory. Yeah, on the W3175, 3275, this 3647 socket, most, if not all of the CPUs um, will support registered error correcting memory. This is a really important distinction over X299 because when X299 debuted with the 7000 series chips like the 7980XE, I've got a motherboard here with the 7980XE that has a really just a fabulously ancient BIOS 
and it works great, it works fine with registered error correcting memory. Intel turned that off, that was a mistake. That was not supposed to support that, the hardware supports that, but it is a software limitation. So Intel turned that off in software. So if you, you know, happen to DIY your own workstation and you relied on registered error correcting memory because Intel, you know, said it wasn't supported, it just happened to work, then they legit broke it. Uh, not a good situation. Registered error correcting memory is legit supported on this platform. Not only that, error correction is qualified. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But that means that somebody has actually put testing into it and you have options for how error correction is handled. Most people don't realize that error correction, um, it's, it's really the platform and the operating system working together. So you can have platform first error correction and you can have, um, you know, operating system first error correction. So in operating system first error correction, the operating system is notified of a memory error and the operating system can decide to take action. In platform first error handling, it's usually to do with single bit errors. The platform will just handle dealing with that single bit error, just reporting it usually, and nothing else happens. If you get a two bit error, technically the system should shut down. But with platform error handling and depending on how the exception handling that is raised, you get into a situation where, okay, we had a two bit memory error, but it was in a region of memory that was not actually being used by the operating system. So in that case, it should not result in a system shutdown. It was just in an unallocated area or a previously allocated area that was then, you know, freed. The system should not shut down in that case because technically that memory is not used and we're sure that the integrity of the system is maintained. There's a lot of little gotchas with that. And uh, this platform has been qualified for all of those edge cases. Intel's put, you know, millions, probably tens of millions of dollars into qualifying that. So if you're going to build a Xeon workstation and you need tons of memory support and you just need Xeon, the EVGA SR3 Dark, you really should look at it. It's not just a gamer motherboard. It's got dual Intel 10 gig NICs. It's got a ton of PCIe slots. Look at that PCIe layout. You've got onboard U.2, you've got onboard SATA, you've got onboard M.2. You have test points if you're into that. You can also disable different PCIe slots without physically removing the device. So if you're doing things like hardware qualification or testing in Linux, it's really great for that. This system configured behind me, I've got two Phantom Gaming, ASRock Phantom Gaming, an RX 5500 and an RX 5600. I'm doing Linux qualification on this. This is the easiest and best platform to do driver development and driver tweaks because, well, you know, AMD's Navi has that reset bug and I've been banging my head against that for, you know, a very, very long time. Jeff on the level one forums has been banging his head against it. There's a, there's a patch that kind of works around it. This is one of the test machines that I'm using for all of that testing and all of that work. And, uh, this is a great platform for that because I can just toggle the PCIe uh, slots on and off without actually having to physically remove the card. It's a really great setup for that. And these ASRock cards work really well for gaming and, you know, doing that kind of thing. I can also pick, you know, which one I want to initialize first. Uh, there's other really fun things that you can do with the platform that's pretty great. One last feature that I'll mention is sub-NUMA clustering. This is a really interesting thing about the Xeon platform. So that Xeon, that 28 core piece of silicon, it's one giant piece of silicon. It's large. Half of the memory channels, you know, it's a six channel memory controller. So I mean, automatically you've got more slots. It's gonna support more memory. 512 gigabytes officially from Intel though. I think it probably supports more than that with higher density registered error correction dims. But I didn't tell you that because of the aforementioned 7000 series bug. No one say anything about that. So anyway, memory, what does memory have to do with, you know, the, the silicon being large? Well, if you notice the way that it's physically arranged, you've got three slots on the top, three slots on the bottom. You can actually enable a software feature of the CPU called sub NUMA clustering. And effectively what that does is it splits the silicon into two NUMA nodes. And so one NUMA node has triple channel memory and the other NUMA node has triple channel memory. This is great because it lowers the latency of the memory access, but it, it hurts your memory bandwidth because we're talking three channels instead of six channels, but three memory channels is, is still about 75 gigabytes per second in your best case scenario. So that's a lot of memory bandwidth for, you know, half of the cores on your CPU. 
The other cool thing that that's good for is things like gaming. You can claw back some of the, the latency because if you if you compare Intel Intel, like we've got the new 10 core CPUs, the latency there is shockingly low because of that CPU architecture. It's just that that CPU architecture uh, is not well suited for a ton of cores. And so the latency gets weird moving from eight, the eighth core to the ninth core to the 10th core. So like cores nine and 10 have uh, measurably higher memory latency than cores, you know, one through eight, which is a really interesting situation. Subnuma clustering on Xeon, you can turn that on. Uh, I got EVGA to add that option into a special test BIOS for me so that I could do experiments and testing and Linux qualification and that kind of thing. So it's fun. It's a fun thing to experiment with, but I thought that was interesting in terms of memory latency that even though this is one monolithic piece of silicon, memory latency still, you know, is a factor there. Now you might be thinking, well, wait, all this talk about Xeon, what about Threadripper? Threadripper actually relates to a lot of the things that we've been touching on. I'll start with memory latency. So with Threadripper, you've got a ton of cache, which effectively will hide some of the memory latency, but because you've got your compute silicon and your memory controller silicon, there actually is quite a bit of a delay connecting that you know one piece of silicon to another physical piece of silicon. And then the memory controller and IO, you know, your IO die on the AMD platform then has to go to memory. There is a fair bit of latency there, but the AMD CPUs have a ton of memory cache to try to make up for that. So more of system memory is cached in the CPU so you don't have to do that round trip to memory in the first place. For things like gaming, you can really see this in benchmarks because at lower resolutions, it's just a game of how fast you can get stuff in and out of memory into the GPU. And that's really, uh, you know, CPU operations. And you see generally Intel do better on that on their desktop platform. Now on the 3647 platform, uh, it's not as good as Intel's desktop platform and maybe not even as good as Threadripper. So Threadripper with its uh, larger cache comes out ahead mostly in most benchmarks. Subnuma clustering changes that a little bit, but not dramatically. The other thing with Threadripper is a 256 gig memory limit. Now the 256 gig memory limit, I've been doing some experiments with things like game compiling and very large projects, and I generally haven't encountered as many problems with that as I expected. 256 gigs of memory for the Threader platform does seem to be okay for most of the workloads that I'm familiar with. Uh, you know, things that are more developer oriented, some machine learning things, that kind of thing. In places where I have managed to run out of 256 gigs of memory, I did something like add an Intel Optane physical storage device for swap, that helps, but you know, that's still dramatically slower. It's an order of magnitude slower than main memory. This platform officially supported 512 gigs of memory and because it supports registered error correcting memory as opposed to just unbuffered, uh, unbuffered error correcting memory, you've got a lot more options in terms of DIMMs that you buy, that kind of thing. This platform, the Intel platform, is also uh, better suited for um, slower memory. So like 2666 is pretty common. Uh, and reasonably priced error correcting memory. The Intel platform doesn't really suffer all that much from having slower memory, again, because of the physical chip architecture. Threadripper in general is faster, especially if you have faster memory though. The, the faster the memory, the faster the, the Infinity Fabric runs. I mean, you can run it asynchronously, but then that's a latency penalty. So depending on what you're doing, that may actually be worse performance. Threadripper 32 cores or even 64 cores, if your workload will happily use CPU cores and, and not be constrained by memory bandwidth or anything like that, that's an option. The PCIe layout. There's not a Threadripper motherboard that I know of that doesn't have more than four slots, not counting the by one slots. I don't know why that is. I don't know if that's a PCIe 4 limitation or just the cost of redrivers or nobody really wants to do, you know, the, the, uh, uh, you know, the motherboard design. I mean, to be sure, this is an expensive socket 3647 motherboard from EVGA. Comparable Threadripper motherboards are about half the price, but they've also got only four physical expansion slots. This thing has six physical slots and two, uh, two U.2, which is kind of crazy because Threadripper actually has more PCIe lanes than this thing. 44 lanes for Skylake, 48 lanes for Cascade Lake. I, I think, don't 100% quote me on that because I've got to do more testing with uh, the Cascade Lake CPUs, but yeah, the Threadripper platform overall has more PCIe lanes and yet physical motherboards with slots, I don't know what that's about, that's really odd. And then finally, uh, the qualification, the error correcting qualification. So this one is kind of a weird one. 
AMD says Threadripper error correction support is up to the motherboard partners, but I get the feeling that most, if not all, motherboard partners for AMD are playing it fast and loose with that error correction qualification. Uh, I've actually been kind of indirectly working with ASRock the most. Uh, there's a user on our forum that's been sort of chasing down error correction compatibility. And there is a whole, the whole platform first error correction versus operating system first error correction. But it doesn't seem like the error correction implementation on Threadripper is a complete one. Uh, from what I understand, that issue has been escalated to AMD and they're looking into it or they're going to provide more documentation or testing for it. Uh, single bit errors are reported, but it may be that two bit errors are not reported or dealt with correctly. And this may be down to operating system, you know, lack of operating system drivers or support or some other things. We're looking into it. It's not like error correction is not working at all, I think, but it's definitely not the same warm and fuzzy situation on AMD as it is on the Intel platform. And most of that seems to be because of the whole, well, it's up to the motherboard vendor to qualify ECC and the motherboard vendors might be playing it fast and loose with ECC qualification on Threadripper. It may be that they just don't think that Threadripper customers care all that much about ECC. And that, that may be true. I don't know. But the ECC implementation on the Intel platform is super qualified. And this motherboard, because it supports ridiculously fast memory, means that its memory interface design is, you know, that much higher quality. And because this motherboard is designed for the super fast gamer memory, that also means that a lot of care has been put into managing all aspects of the memory implementation on this motherboard. You know, I'm using it right now with 256 gigs of registered error correcting memory. It's not an issue as long as you've got sufficient airflow over the memory because the memory does get kind of warm. Uh, it's basically fine. And that's another way that this motherboard sets itself apart from OEM motherboards. Because it's designed for that crazy overclock, you know, 4400 megahertz plus DDR4 memory, everything about the memory implementation on this motherboard is designed for the high end. You don't get that on an OEM motherboard. It's like, oh, Intel officially supports 2666. We're gonna qualify and test 2666. Nope, EVGA goes above and beyond. And again, second most common source of failures is that CPU memory interconnect. Even the CPU socket has more gold in it for you know more better connections. Technically it's to carry more current, but hey, I'll take more gold in the socket any day because you're gonna be inserting and removing CPUs. No, not really if it's a workstation, but more gold, uh, the better the electrical connection. I mean, it's it's a little bit of a meme, but uh, yeah, let's 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 go with that. So between that and the dual onboard Intel 10 gig NIC and the really high end audio implementation and a ton of USB ports and you get the internal USB header for BIOS flashing and you've got multiple BIOSes on the board. It really does make a lot of sense as a workstation motherboard. It seems kind of crazy, but this high end gamer stuff, especially if you're not going to push it to the limits, really will will be a good choice for a solid and stable workstation. Yeah, you got to DIY it a little bit, but it's, it's really not too bad. You don't have to use all four eight pin headers for the CPU. You can get by with two, which is what just about every modern, you know, 700 watt and above power supply has. Uh, it has water cooling, a water cooling block built in for the VRM. But again, if you're not pushing it beyond that about 250 watt area, as long as you've got airflow over that area, you don't have to actually water cool the VRM. You just got the option. If you do water cool, you're going to have a barely audible machine. It's been on this entire time just doing crazy computation. And, you know, we've got two radiators that can dissipate over a thousand watts of heat. So those fans barely have to spin. It is a whisper quiet machine. EVGA really has put an incredible board together for socket 3647. It's understated and it's an amazing piece of engineering and it will work with more CPUs other than the W3175X. You can use CPUs that just came out a month ago, which is great. And uh, no one is doing any, any kind of like, hey, wait a minute, would this motherboard make sense for a workstation? If you're gonna DIY a workstation, if you're not gonna get in trouble for DIYing a workstation, or if it's not gonna be like, oh, this computer was hit by lightning, it's your fault because you didn't order a Dell or an HP system, this would be a great choice to build it. So I'm thinking academic institutions, you know, some of the aforementioned day trader things, that kind of thing. That said, you know, Threadripper is a thing, and 
Threadripper does do a lot of things that the Intel 3647 platform currently doesn't do. But when we're talking about the PCIe layout here, I've physically got more usable slots than Threadripper, despite the irony that Threadripper has more PCIe lanes. Why? Oh, it's frustrating. Threadripper mother with more PCIe slots when? Just, uh, just, I need an X16 and then like the entire thing filled with X8. That would be great. And the same thing is true with Epic. Oh yeah, Epic. So you may be thinking, you're probably screaming at the monitor at this point, why aren't you talking about Epic? Well. <laughs> this is a tie-in motherboard that's going to be in a future level one video. And this is a completely, relatively normal ATX-ish form factor. And yeah, you can run Epic on a workstation. You're not gonna get the clocks, the really high clock speed, unless you get the 7F CPU, but then the 7F CPUs have more wattage and there's some things you need to worry about with that. But yeah, you can look for a review of this motherboard this uh, tie-in server class motherboard uh, for an epic based workstation but you know again you know I can just sort of look here I've got I've got five expansion slots now these five expansion slots are all 16 lanes which is really awesome but epic was not exactly meant for workstations and when I asked about things like Windows qualification and driver qualifications from some of the OEMs, I get kind of nervous replies. I don't want to put anybody in the spot. I don't want to name names, but it's really kind of surprising with the whole, it's like, hey, let's run Windows 10. It's like, oh, let's not, let's not run Windows 10 on, on Epic. So it's an odd, it's an odd situation. And I'll let you in on a secret. With things like PCIe bus resets and otherwise well-behaved PCI Express devices, Xeon generally kind of works better. And this is, probably down to just teething issues on the AMD side. So like if I've got a, a properly well-behaved PCIe device that actually does support PCIe reset, unlike Navi where we're trying to find a workaround for that, um, it will generally always work. That's not necessarily always true on Threadripper. Sometimes I get PCIe bus errors, sometimes we get device errors. Um, sometimes those things have been fixed with microcode updates from AMD. These are teething issues. <laughs> These problems all go away with money because you can use money to hire talent. And so I think, I think things like, you know, the Navi reset bug from AMD will be caught much earlier in product development cycles in the future. I hope, fingers crossed. Uh, but on this platform, on the Intel, doing that kind of testing and device validation that's like, I'm going to pass through this network card, or I'm going to pass through this NVMe. Oh, that didn't work. Let's reset the VM. I don't generally have the problems that I do on Threadripper. Not that Threadripper is problematic. Threadripper is great. It just has some rough edges. I think Intel's been doing the server qualification stuff just a little bit longer. So, so yeah, there are a lot of options in the marketplace, and it's up to you to choose what is right for you. But I wanted to take a look at the EVGA SR3 and especially the SR3 in a workstation context because I don't think anybody's really talked about that. The EVGA SR3 Dark is definitely destined for legendary status in my opinion because I've been using the crap out of it to work on this Linux stuff, dual booting, well, du dual booting Windows and Linux, but Windows with the guys that are running it in Linux. It is a great motherboard. It is awesome. I love it. And what this is level one. Yeah, check out the other video that I did on the EVGA SR3 Dark way back a long time ago, but uh, the SR3 Dark is a workstation motherboard. Yeah, it makes sense to me. I'm signing out and I'll see you later.